Hi again, everyone. Uh, in this video, the subject will be spectral functions. This is the last uh, application we will be considering in the context of non-zero temperature QCD uh, on the lattice. And I would like to start by introducing some nomenclature and uh, some phenomenology about the quark gluon plasma, um, which will lead us to the definition of what a spectral function is and why is it so crucial to uh, be able to measure it. Um, afterwards, we will go through two uh, examples of uh, spectral function computations that we would like to be able to bring to a decent level of uh, precision from uh, the lattice. And then I will discuss in general our spectral functions obtained and also show you some results as usual so you also get a feeling of uh, um, what is the outcome of uh, lattice studies in this uh, context. Okay, so let's start, um, and I would like to start by saying, um, by telling you how AVI and collision experiments are really our opportunity to study the creation and the evolution of uh, the non-abelian quark gluon plasma that we spent a lot of words about, especially in the last uh, video on screening effects and screening masses. Um, however, this... Uh, would require describing realistically a many-body system in a totally <laughs> out of equilibrium situation. And in particular, the T evolution and relaxation back to equilibrium after the collision has happened of uh, conserved charge densities, such as electric charge or energy or momentum, is encoded in what we call transport coefficients. So first key concept in this video are transport coefficients encoding this T evolution and relaxation back to equilibrium of conserved charge densities. And then again, thinking about the experiment, what uh, is it that actually happens in a heavy ion collision? There is a firewall, which is uh, how we call the object that is formed by the two fragments that are uh, of the nuclei that are knocked out of each nucleus in the collision and that are undergoing uh, strong interactions throughout the process. Um, and then in a, an experimental setup, we have detectors that, um, apart from uh, uh, detecting the two uh, spectator, uh, the, the spectator uh, nucleons from the two nuclei that just go through, uh, they more specifically detect decay products of this fireball. And they do record the corresponding distribution in the azimuthal angle around the beam axis. This can be parameterized by Fourier coefficients and uh, in the uh, experiments through the detection of uh, decay products, one can extract the coefficients in this uh, expansion. In particular, if um, one runs an heavy ion collision experiment, one will observe that in peripheral heavy ion collisions, which are heavy ion collisions where the overlapping part of the two uh, targets is, uh, not, uh, is smaller, so they, they don't collide exactly as on, but they um, collide in a peripheral way, uh, then there is a large elliptic flow which corresponds to a large number of uh, some specific coefficients in this expansion. And what that physically means is that um, the system after the collision keeps memory and track of the anisotropic almond-shaped collision region that uh, is characteristic of a peripheral heavy ion collision. Um, and this is what we call elliptic flow. Um, the fact that uh, the, the value, which is very large, of this V2 coefficient. And what that suggests is that uh, the fluid that we are looking at the evolution of behaves as um, an almost perfect fluid with a very small shear viscosity to entropy density ratio, which is indicated by eta over S. Um, and then kinetic theory, which is one of the, theo of the theories that are used in order to interpret uh, what happens after the collision, 
interprets this small value of the shear viscosity in terms of a short mean free path of the particles and therefore um, the strength of the interaction. Once more, you can click on this link in order to get to a recent review about this subject. So, our starting point in trying to gain insight uh, on the evolution of the quark gluon plasma after a heavy ion collision, um, and in particular um, uh, about the dynamic properties of the medium which is created uh, in the collision, is looking at the response of the medium, uh, that is to say the dissipation uh, rate, of log long wavelength and slow frequency perturbation in energy density, momentum density, and conserved charges in general. And the medium response is parameterized by the already introduced transport coefficients that are bulk and shear viscosity, diffusion coefficients, electric conductivity, which in turn is connected to the photon emissivity and to the thermal dilepton production rate, and many others. Now, how do we uh, obtain, or what, are, what is the, the object that we can measure that encodes information on the transport properties? This is an important uh, question we need to provide an answer for, because uh, at the moment we are sort of blind. We would like to find a way of describing something that is characteristic of a medium uh, while it relaxes back to equilibrium, but it is outside of equilibrium, and it is not clear how we are going to do that uh, with, the, for example, a lattice simulation. However, transport properties um, are um, to be obtained via so-called Kubo formulae, which are based on linear response theory, uh, by the small frequency form of the spectral functions. So we ended up with <laughs> mentioning the subject of the video, spectral functions. And what are these? These are quantities that, via an integral transform, are related to the conserved current correlators that we measure in lattice QCD. So what is the chain? You have conserved current correlators, which is what you can measure in lattice QCD. Then there is an integral transform that connects these uh, correlators to the spectral functions and the small frequency behavior of the spectral function through Kubo formula can be connected to the transport properties of the plasma. In this way, in this intricate set of uh, steps, we get from uh, something that we can measure on the lattice to, um, to get it reflected into transport properties of the plasma. It must be kept in mind that uh, it is important to look at those objects uh, because it uh, helps us reaching a very important goal, uh, which is uh, understanding uh, what is the right framework to apply for the real-time description of uh, the evolution of the plasma, because different dynamical regimes demand different real-time descriptions for the QGP dynamics as a function of uh, the temperature and corresponds to different characteristic features in the spectral functions. So if we are able to help identifying these characteristic features, then we know uh, what is the best way to treat them in a real-time uh, framework, which is different, which is not uh, what we have with Lattice QCD. To have a better picture in mind, I think it is useful for you to look at this uh, sketch of uh, what happens in the um, heavy ion collision experiments. And this is the almond shape region that I was talking about. This is a, the, the, the sketch of a peripheral collision. And then QGP is formed. There is a hydro expansion and then freeze out and hadronization as the quark gluon plasma um, is cooled down. And then below you have labels uh, which uh, are telling you more or less what is the uh, more appropriate description that one should uh, employ when one wants to look at the real-time evolution of uh, the state uh, that, uh, that is present at, that's at each and every stage of the collision. What is the uh, key issue over here? That there are many characteristic length scales in the plasma, for example, the length over which the chromoelectric fields are screened, which we have already discussed, 
and the length over which magnetic fields are also screened, uh, which corresponds to a different scale, at least uh, in the high temperature limit. Um, and then we also have just discussed that the small screening masses of non-trivial flavor quantum number states is 2 pi over t at high temperature. This we saw in the plots of the screening masses at the end of the previous uh, video. And the mean path of a quark gluon quasi-particle in a kinetic theory kind of description uh, from elliptic flow uh, can be uh, found to parametrically go like g to the power of 4 times t. Uh, to the power of minus one. As you see, these are many different uh, length scales and they are associated to different uh, physical phenomena. The problem is that um, at temperatures of uh, the temperatures that uh, we observe or we expect to um, have when the heavy ion collision experiment is run, uh, there is a non-trivial interplay between these different length scales. And, uh, Therefore, the description of the behavior of uh, the plasma is very, very non-trivial and very, very complicated. And it is important because of that to uh, look at spectral functions and uh, yeah, identify what are the relevant dynamical regimes by identifying key features of the spectral functions, which signal which of these length scales is important over the other, for example. Okay, and I said at the beginning we would have gone through uh, two examples in order to uh, get a better feeling of what we can learn. And the first example I want to propose to you is the one of the shear viscosity. Um, I mentioned that experiments are um, consistent with the description of the plasma as an almost perfect fluid which means it has a very small value of uh, this transport coefficient we introduced already, which is the eta over s, shear viscosity over entropy density. Perturbation theory in the leading log approximation gives some parametric behavior with the coupling of uh, the shear viscosity and holography um, uh, also as a prediction at infinite gauge coupling or number of colors, so infinite Toft uh, coupling, if one wants to be precise, um, that for a SUSI supersymmetric cousin of QCD, in particular n equal 4 supersymmetric Young Mills, um, gives a lower bound for this quantity, which is 1 over 4 pi. And that is not so different from what has been observed experimentally. Now, what is this uh, supposed to mean from a physical point of view? What eta parameterizes is the, how eff efficiently the momentum of a layer of fluid, assuming that the momentum is uh, defined in, uh, by that, uh, to be in the plane of that uh, layer, diffuses in the direction orthogonal to the momentum. And then we have a diffusion constant that can be defined as eta over epsilon energy density plus uh, where epsilon plus p is the enthalpy density. And the time evolution of the transverse momentum is related to um, the transport of the shear stress, Txy, through the momentum conservation equation that I am reporting on the slide. So this is what eta is from uh, a physical point of view, what it describes. Um, the response of the fluid to externally applied shear stress is then encoded in the equilibrium ensemble in how thermal fluctuations of the shear stress are dissipating in real time. For uh, measuring the shear viscosity, we then need to start uh, with the time correlation, which is defined by uh, the correlator given on the slide. And it is the Fourier transform of this uh, which uh, gives the spectral function, which is the object we are interested in. And then, um, as already mentioned, uh, there are Kubo formulae inspired by the linear response theory um, that ensures that um, the transport coefficient, uh, which corresponds to that uh, specific correlator, is obtained in uh, 
from the behavior at the origin of the spectral function based on this equation. Um, the spectral function is then related to the Euclidean correlator um, by analytic continuation, meaning that we can extract phi rho omega by considering the imaginary part of uh, g tilde of e, where omega is, uh, goes into, is analytically continued, and uh, in particular omega n is one Matsubara uh, frequency. And then the recipe for extracting eta is uh, generically um, clear. One wants to calculate the Euclidean correlator, which is what I'm calling uh, GE. One wants to determine the spectral function by analytic continuation, which leads to um, GE tilde and to rho of omega. And one wants to or has to read off uh, the shear viscosity from the slope of the spectral function at the origin. Okay, but the second bit is a very tricky one, the determination of the spectral function by analytic continuation. Why? Because uh, it is an integral transform that gives the connection in mixed time and spatial momentum uh, representation um, of the um, Euclidean correlator with the spectral function. And then uh, the integral equation needs to be inverted if we want to obtain rho of omega and kappa while having measured the corresponding Euclidean correlator. And normally measuring the corresponding Euclidean correlator means uh, collecting a handful of data for the lattice correlator. And then through that we would like to get information about a function that in principle can be can have uh, arbitrarily complicated features. And this is what makes uh, this inversion and the measurement of the spectral function uh, through analytic continuation of the corresponding Euclidean correlator a very tough to tackle uh, and ill-defined inverse problem from a mathematical point of view. Moving to another example of uh, a transport coefficient and how is this extracted uh, coming from uh, a lattice perspective. We can consider electric conductivity, which is very important because it determines the soft photon emission of the quark gluon plasma. And again, like all other transport coefficients can be extracted via a Kubo formula from uh, some specific correlator, which in the case of electric conductivity is the vector current correlator. So the first thing you need to know is how the electromagnetic current is defined in QCD in terms of the elementary quark constituents. And then one considers the current current correlator in the Euclidean at zero spatial momentum, um, or if you want, we suppress the momentum dependence. And um, then the spectral representation of the correlator uh, with k, the usual cos uh, over sinh uh, kernel that we have uh, seen already, is given by this formula over here. And this is what defines the spectral function. Then from linear response theory for the electric conductivity, we get the value of the electric conductivity through the Kubo formula, which connects it to the omega to zero limit of the ratio between the spectral function as a function of omega and omega itself. And in this case, then uh, rho electromagnetic of omega will receive contributions from um, the different uh, components um, in this, according to this formula. Then the spectral function can be obtained in principle from the correlator, however, in the electric conductivity as much as in the case of the shear viscosity, we are dealing with uh, an ill-defined inverse problem, which is made particularly uh, problematic by the fact that the input data are Euclidean data of uh, the lattice computed correlators, and uh, by themselves they do not single out a unique answer because it is only one handful of discrete data, and from that one would like to solve the integral equation uh, or invert it and obtain the spectral function. And then one needs um, some sort of uh, regularization of this inversion, uh, which means one needs to um, 
do the inversion, uh, but with uh, some criteria or assumptions that uh, allow for singling out um, a row of omega from uh, a number of solutions that all, in principle, would be able to reproduce our discrete input. Let's not forget that our input is not just discrete, but also noisy. It comes with errors because uh, of how we obtain the results in a Monte Carlo simulation. Um, however, for that, uh, various methods have been uh, proposed and considered for obtaining a spectral function in general. So now this applies to the case of shear viscosity or electric conductivity or any other transport coefficient. One method is the Bacchus-Gilbert method, and here you have the reference. This comes from a very different uh, field. In the case of the Bacchus-Gilbert method, no assumption about any particular feature of the spectral density is made uh, at the beginning. One just starts with an estimator that uh, is, um, corresponds to this integral expression, and uh, the delta, uh, the um, resolution function uh, respects some normalization condition. So what we here called rho tilde of omega zero is a convolution of the exact spectral function with the resolution function that respects this normalization condition. And uh, one can write the resolution function as uh, a linear combination through coefficients qj of uh, the kernel kappa. And uh, kappa is what appears in this integral equation and relates the spectral density with g of tau. Now, with the property of linearity of rho tilde that uh, is obvious in its integral defining integral expression, one can um, also express rho tilde in terms of the coefficients and uh, of g, which is... Um, useful for, uh, because it leads to easier error estimates. The resolution in uh, omega or transformed space um, as a, a width uh, or can be obtained by the width of the uh, resolution function. And this leads to the definition of this integral quantity over here, which we called d. And then what needs, what remains to be determined are uh, precisely these coefficients that appear in the definition of the resolution equation as well as in the definition of rho tilde d omega, which is our um, estimator. How uh, does one do that? Uh, through uh, a minimization of this width function that we have just defined, uh, which is done while keeping fixed the norm of the resolution function. And the result of the minimization um, yields this uh, quantity over here. So you have a ratio of uh, w power of minus 1 um, at w0, uh, jk. This is a matrix, so and, and these are the jk components of the matrix, times rk, where r is defined by this other integral equation. And then you have uh, this combination at the denominator, and let's look at the definition of this uh, matrix, which is also uh, given on the slide. And what is the problem in uh, running uh, through these all steps uh, and applying the Barcos Gilbert method as we know it? That the matrix W in this case is extremely ill conditioned and it itself needs uh, regularization, which then is achieved through uh, covariance or the Tikhonov method or uh, singular value decomposition. So this is uh, still a very hard problem to tackle, but we have sort of uh, at least sketched one method through which one can um, obtain these coefficients and then plug them in, in the expression that relates the spectral function to the coefficients. This is not the only method that has been proposed. There are also Bayesian methods that have been proposed, uh, among which um, the maximum entropy method, which is frequently applied. Um, it holds that the most probable um, spectral function can be extracted if one um, considers or gives some prior knowledge uh, H along with the lattice data D. 
somehow in this uh, case, in applying this method, the problem of uh, finding out the most probable spectral function given the lattice data is cast via the Bayes theorem as a conditional probability of the form given on the slides, um, where the L and S uh, in the last uh, part of the formula are the standard likelihood and the shannon Yanes uh, entropy. And we can um, identify the meaning of all the quantities that appears in this um, equation, particularly on the left hand side, you have the posterior probability for the test spectral function to be the correct one, uh, given the prior information and the data. So given D and H. And this is uh, given by this ratio, and the quantities involved in the ratio are the probability to, I should rather highlight this one, the probability to find the data D if uh, rho were the correct spectral function, and the probability, the prior probability, which uh, sort of gives us uh, a measure of the compatibility between the prior info that we are uh, using and the test uh, spectral function. And these two quantities appear multiplied at the numerator, and then you need to divide by uh, this other quantity, which is called the evidence, and it is uh, a raw independent normalization. This method was derived um, using arguments from two-dimensional image reconstruction, so it also comes from um, a very different domain of research, and you can look at the original paper by clicking on this link. And um, it is sort of designed, if we are careful enough, with uh, what we uh, bring in as H in order to introduce the least possible additional correlations to the end results beyond what is uh, contained in the input lattice data that we are trying to describe. Okay, and with that, I'm already at the final slide where I plan I planned to show you about to show you some results that have been obtained for a specific transport coefficient, in particular the electric conductivity, and employing one specific uh, method of the two that I have mentioned to you uh, that helps us solving the ill-defined inverse problem through which one obtains the spectral function starting from the Euclidean correlator, which is the maximum entropy method. Please bear in mind this is uh, partial view of the topic, there are more methods that can be considered and many more transport coefficients that one can try to extract. Uh, they all have in common this uh, ill-defined inverse problem and uh, they are all uh, quite non-trivial. So in 2014, Arts and other people have obtained, for example, results for the electric conductivity. You can uh, look at the conserved vector current correlator as a function of uh, tau t, which is the Euclidean time. And um, one can also from there extract the spectral function, uh, rho of omega divided by omega square. And in this plot, the vertical dashed lines indicates the mass of the corresponding vector meson. You can read out the different temperatures that have been uh, considered and uh, you can see that the analysis was performed independently uh, for the light and the strange sector. And out of this reconstruction of the um, spectral function, one can then um, extract um, via Kubo formula the corresponding transport coefficient, which was uh, then plotted in this other plot separately for the light and for the strange sector. And one can look, uh, this is the important bit of information, at the temperature dependence of this uh, transport coefficient as a function uh, of the temperature. In this case, what you have on the y-axis is the transport coefficient normalized by T and also by uh, this quantity that I'm specifying on the slide. Which concludes our uh, discussion about spectral functions um, and uh, in particular also our discussion about non-zero temperature QCD before we move on to non-zero density QCD. So thanks for watching. <laughs>